Welcome back to our channel, your deep dive companion into the investing world. Today we will be talking about Amcor Technology, a notable player in the outsource semiconductor assembly and test industry, OSAT. Established in 1968, Amcor Technology operates globally, providing robust services for testing and packaging for semiconductors. But how does Amcor keep its space in this rapid changing industry? Let's dive into it. Amcor started in Korea with a single semiconductor business and has since expanded its reach worldwide. The name Amcor is a blend of America and Korea, indicative of the company's roots and its dedication to trust and reliability, boasting over 30,000 employees across uh, 20 manufacturing locations in 8 countries, Amcor's international impact is significant. Amcor's evolution reveals a history of progressive entrepreneurship and growth. From its initial semiconductor export in 1970 to its IPO in 1999 and strategic acquisitions such as Toshiba's Malaysian Semiconductor Packaging Operations, J Devices Corporation and Nanium, Amcor has consistently adapted to the semiconductor industry's dynamic nature. Amcor technology, the brainchild of Hayan Su Kim, originated as Anam Industrial. The company initiated its semiconductor business in 1968 and started exporting semiconductors enclosed in metal cans to the US by 1970, a first for Korean exports. Partnering with Jo Jin Kim, Amcor ventured beyond its local borders, targeting sales and marketing in the US while concentrating on production and R&D in Korea. In 1998, the then Amcor Electronic went public, transitioning into Amcor Technology Incorporated. Amcor has added several businesses to its portfolio over the years. Notably, it acquired Portugal-based Nanium, a pioneer in wafer-level packaging YLP, technology. This acquisition bolstered Amcor's capability in the expanding YLP market, a technology widely used in devices like smartphones, tablets and various consumer electronics. Recently, Amcor has stirred conversation in the Valley Investors Club, an exclusive digital hub where seasoned investors, including the likes of Monish Pobrai, share their top investment insights. The discourse brings to the fore Amcor's robust market standing and its growth potential in the OSAT industry. However, it's not without critique. Some members raised concerns about the company's vulnerability to the cyclical semiconductor industry and the optimistic valuation assumptions used. I hope you really enjoyed this video because one method I've found effective in honing my investing skills is delving directly into the company's profile. This approach not only helps me comprehend investment theses and critiques from others, but also opens me to constructive uh, feedback on my own interpretations of the fact. This way we can learn together. So with this being said, let's take a closer look at Amcor's business model products and services. The company offers end-to-end -end solutions in the areas of packaging design, assembly and test services for a wide range of semiconductor devices. But you may be asking, what does this mean in simple terms? Think of a semiconductor as the brain of the most modern electronics, like your smartphone, computer and even your car. Semiconductors are tiny devices that control electricity flow in circuits, allowing electronics to function. These semiconductors, however, need to be packaged before they can be used in devices. This packaging process involves enclosing the semiconductor in a protective material to prevent physical damage or corrosion, and to allow it to be attached to a circuit board. The packaged semiconductor are then tested to ensure they function correctly. As an outsourced service provider, Amcor doesn't make the semiconductors themselves. Rather, other companies who manufacture semiconductors contract Amcor to handle the packaging and testing. 
This allows those companies to focus on their own specialities, such as designing and manufacturing the semiconductors, while MCOR takes care of the rest. So, in simple terms, MCOR is like a specialized packaging and quality control service for the brains of electronic devices. Now, how has this translated into financial performance? Don't worry, I'll try to make this as simple as it gets. But don't skip it, because even though numbers are not everything in an investment thesis, they are a handy tool. In 2022, MCOR's revenue was a significant 7.1 billion. Breaking it down, the lion's share of this income, about 75.7%, or 5.4 billion, came from their advanced products. These are cutting-edge, high-tech devices that often have higher prices due to their newness and sophistication of their technology. On the other hand, their mainstream products, the more mature technologies that have been around for a while, pulled in about 24% of the revenues, which equates to 1.7 billion. These are your run-of-the-mill chips, sensors and power devices, nothing too flashy. Looking at their profit, we see a gross profit of 1.3 billion. This is what Amcor got to keep after they paid for the production of their products. When we subtract further operational costs like salaries and rent, they went left with an operating income of about 900 million. Before paying income tax, their pre-tax income was about 860 million, and after all was said and done, Amcor's net income was 765 million. So, what took the bite out of these profits? Their cost of goods sold or COGS was about uh, 5.8, which covers everything from raw materials to employee wages to facility maintenance. Their net interest income was in the negative, showing us that they paid 45.8 million more in interest on their debts than they earned from their investments. Though running the business incurs more costs, like selling general and administrative expenses, or SG&A, which came up to be uh, 280 million, and research and development, or R&D, which cost them 149 million. This can be seen as an expense or as an investment, but the fact is that it was 150 million. Uh, there was also 1.2 million payout uh, to minority interest shareholders uh, who are not part of MCOR but own a stake in the business. And of course, uh, about 90 million uh, had to be set aside for the taxes. So the big question is, how can a company like MCOR, with these slim profit margins, hope to increase their earnings. One of the key strategies could be scaling. As MCOR grows, they may be able to benefit from economies of scale, where larger production could lead to significant cost savings. This is something we'll be watching closely in the future. Now let's delve into MCOR's technology balance sheet. Think of the balance sheet as a photograph of the company's financial health at a particular moment in time. It shows us what the company owns, assets, what it owes, liabilities, and its net worth, equity. MCOR's total current assets amount to 3.3 billion. This includes everything that could be converted to cash within a year. Like the loose change in your pocket. Within that, there is 1.2 of actual cash on hand and 1.4 of receivables, which is money owed to MCOR by its customers. Their inventories, all the goods they currently have on hand, amount to 630 million, and the last 65 million in other current assets, which is anything else that can be turned into cash quickly. Switching over to their long-term assets, we are looking at 3.5b. These are the things that are valuable but not readily convertible to cash. For instance, Amcor has 3.3b in net property, plant and equipment, a fancy way of saying physical assets, minus any depreciation. Their intangible assets, which are valuable but not physical, like patents or brand names, stand at 21.5 million, which is pretty modest. And they have 192 million in other long-term assets. Now, on to liabilities, Amcor's total liabilities 
everything it owes amounts to 3.1b. Within that, current liabilities, the debts and obligations due within a year are 1.7b. This includes accounts payable and accrued expenses of 1.3 billion, which is money owed to suppliers or for expenses yet to be paid, and short-term debt and current lease obligations of about 270 million. There is also 81 million in deferred tax and revenue and 7.4 million in other current liabilities. Looking at long-term liabilities, we see 1.1b in long-term debt, money due more than a year from now. There's also 76 million in long-term lease obligations, 93.5 for pensions and retirement benefits, and 202 in other long-term liabilities. Finally, we have the equity. The total equity, the company's net worth, is about 3.7 billion. This includes a little less than 3.7 billion in total stockholders' equity, which is what the stockholders would get if the company were sold today. Uh, there's 30.9 million in minority interests, uh, which is a portion of the subsidiary's company's net assets not owned by the parent company. Um, it also has 1.9 billion in retained earnings, which are profits it has decided to keep and reinvest uh, back into the business. Um, 16.7 million in accumulated other comprehensive income, uh, which represents unrealized gains and losses from various investments and also foreign currency uh, transactions. Uh, they've got 2 billion in additional paid in capital, which is money investors paid to the company over and above the stock price. And finally, they have minus 219 million in treasury stock which are the shares the company has bought back from investors. The negative sign indicates that this reduces the company equity. Now let's consider the cash flow statement as something similar to a bank statement. It tells you how much cash comes in and goes out over a specific period of time. The statement is divided into three parts, cash flow from operations, from investing and from financing. Starting with a cash flow from operations, Amcor generated 1.1 billion. This tells us how much cash comes from the main business operation. The inflow from these operations is 1.4 billion, including a net interest of 770 million from ongoing business. Uh, then there's a 612 million in depreciation, depletion and amortization. These are expenses that lower income, but don't involve any actual cash outflow. Uh, depreciation, depletion and amortization uh, are things like, for example, um, the loss of value of the machinery they use, for example. Then the change in working capital stands at minus 281 million, meaning the company tied up more cash in its operations. There's also a deferred tax of minus uh, 11 million, uh, which is a future tax liability and uh, 13.6 million was spent on stock-based compensation uh, to their management and employees. Lastly, there is a 1.5 million in other operating activities, an outflow of minus 294 million due to regular business expenses. Next, let's go for maybe the most important figure in the cash flow statement, the free, uh, the free cash flow or cash from operations left over after accounting for big investments uh, was about 190 million. The company spent 900 billion on capital expenditures like buying new equipment or uh, constructing new buildings. Uh, the cash flow from investing, showing cash spent or gained from investment activities, was minus 1 billion. This includes a total outflow of uh, about 1 billion from investing and net investment purchases uh, and sales of minus 105 million. Uh, an additional uh, 3 million came in from other investing uh, activities. Now let's take a look at financing, which reflects cash gain or paid from activities like issuing or repaying debt and issuing or buying back stock. Amcor's uh, cash flow from financing was 55 million with a financing inflow of 113 million, including 113 million in issuing, uh, issuance of debt, 
Uh, and the company also paid minus five, uh, 55 million in dividends and spent uh, 3.2 in uh, other financing activities. There was a financing outflow of minus uh, 58.4 million. The impact of exchange rates cost the company uh, 16.3 million, which reflects the impact uh, of changes in exchange rates on foreign held cash. Finally, we consider the overall change of cash. MCOR started the period with 830 million and experienced a net cash change of 131 million, ending up with a cash balance of 962 million. So this gives us a clear picture of how MCOR generate, generated and spent its cash. Remember, the cash flow statement is crucial because the company needs cash to grow and survive, even if it's profitable on paper. Sweet! Now that we have a key financial data, Let's take a look at how diversified the company is in terms of geography and customers. Well, in the first quarter of 2023, Amcor's top 10 customers accounted for 66% of their net sales, and they are mainly exposed to the USA and equally exposed through Asia, Europe and Japan. We are also going to check out Amcor's stock performance over the last decade, keeping in mind that past performance doesn't guarantee the future. In the past 10 years, Amcor stock had its fair share of ups and downs, quite a roller coaster to be honest. That's the semiconductor market for you, lots of volatility. Still, if you take a step back and look at the bigger picture, you'll see that the overall trend has been going up. Uh, what's behind this trend, though? Well, we are in the digital age and the demand for semiconductors, which are vital components of electronic devices, keep rising. Being a leader uh, supplier in the market, Amcor has been enjoying that ride. Now, with that being said, let's get into the highlights from their Q1 2023 earning calls. To put it simply, Amcor is on fire. We're selling more across all markets which has significantly boosted our revenues. And we're not just making more, we are also retaining more, showing improved profitability. The company is bullish about the future and plans to expand to keep up with demand. That said, every rose has its thorns. The semiconductor industry can be a wild ride with its ups and downs that could sway revenues. Also, we're competing against some heavyweights which might pressure their prices and margins. Moreover, most of our earnings come from just a few customers, so changes in those relationships could really hurt. And since technology and customer needs are always evolving, we've got to keep pace. And of course, with operations in many countries, we have to navigate various political and economic landscapes. So while things seem sunny now, we have to stay vigilant to keep the ball rolling. Now a quick disclaimer before we dive into our valuation. I'd like to make clear that my aim isn't to predict Amcor's future outlook or current value precisely, but rather to document my investment learning journey and track improvements in my reasoning process. Now let's proceed. First, we'll use the discounted cash flow model, a commonly used tool to estimate the value of an investment based on its future cash flows. We'll forecast Amcor's future cash flows, discount them to the present, and compare this value to its current market price. This comparison will help us determine if the, if the stock is undervalued or overvalued. Secondly, we'll utilize a comprehensive investment checklist to assess key business facets such as the company's business model, competitive position, financial health, management quality, and industry trends. This systematic approach aids in revealing crucial insights about the company, thus facilitating a more informed investment decision. By integrating the quantitative discounted cash flow analysis with the qualitative insights from our checklist, we can gain a holistic understanding of Amcor's investment potential. So let's get started. Let's employ our discounted cash flow calculator, which you can find in the video description. 
Although the semiconductor industry has seen substantial growth in the last decade, with Amcor's annual growth rates reaching 88% over, uh, over the last 10 years and 32% over the last 5 years, we need to consider that this pace might slow down. So, given these factors, projecting a 15% growth over the next 5 years and a 20% growth over the next 10 years seems reasonable. We'll also apply a standard discount rate of 10%. The free cash flow multiple, which can be indicative of the business quality, is set at 10, considering Amcor's solid and established business, albeit without a significant competitive advantage. Notably, their uh, current multiple is 38, uh, so our figure is pretty conservative. This gives us an intrinsic value of approximately 6 billion for the business and 24 per share, uh, which is slightly above the current market valuation. So now let's dive into the checklist. Well, my checklist is pretty extensive, so I will distill it in the core questions uh, and I will share the questions in the video description so uh, we can make this checklist more like a conversation. First up is the business basics for Amcor. I'd say their main growth driver is their successful reinvestment strategy, don't you think? They really put those returns on capital employed, ROCE, to work, especially in the consumer electronics sector. Their profit source is also intriguing, as it primarily comes from services provided to the wider semiconductor industry. That's an area that requires high capital expenditures and the big know-how, right? Then comes their competitive advantage. Despite their experience, scale and ge geographical presence, they don't quite match their competitor ASC in size or economies of scale. That's something we need to consider. On the brand strength, would you agree that even though Amcor isn't necessarily a household name, they've secured a firm reputation and strong client portfolio within the industry? I think so. They also quite clearly benefit from economies of scale. And yes, it's worth noting that they operate in a cyclical business environment and maybe they favored from uh, the tailwinds from this cycle. Moving on to valuation and historical performance, their current PE ratio stands at 10, which is lower than its 16-year average of uh, 11.45. Uh, They've had a decent growth trajectory over the last decade, though it's been a bit inconsistent, and they've definitely shown solid returns from R&D. Although I haven't done much research on the management team, uh, I think they've proven to be reliable and honest. Now let's talk financial health and capital structure. Their cash flow growth, though not exactly steady, has been relatively consistent. Their price to owner's earnings uh, ratio is also impressive, ranking better than 71% of 440 uh, companies in the industry. And while debt levels are under control, it's worth noting they don't pay much of a dividend. They do, however, outperform the competition and engage in stock repurchases, despite not being in a major way, since the number of shares outstanding has slightly increased over time. Looking at their accounting practices, I didn't find any evidence of severe losses that could potentially boost net earnings in the future and none of the shenanigans. So um, if you find any of these, please let me know because uh, I couldn't find any in my research. Finally, the future outlook of Amcor seems promising. With just two advanced packaging players and a sustained demand for semiconductors for the next decade or two. But of course, they'll need to heavily invest in R&D and aim for double-digit ROIC, uh, return on capital, uh, on invested capital. Sorry. Uh, potential obstacles include the risk of their small customer base going bust. So there you have it, folks. A comprehensive yet concise checklist for evaluating Amcor. What do you think? Well, folks, that's a wrap on our journey into the world of Amcor, a player in the roller coaster semiconductor industry that's as exciting as volatile. 
With its steady growth, solid financial standing and a hand in technology heartbeat of our digital age, it certainly paints a picture full of possibilities. Remember, this analysis is just a sneak peek into the adventure of investment. There's a whole exciting world of financial exploration out there, and every company has a story to tell. So why not become part of this thrilling journey? Stay tuned so you don't miss out in any other exciting analysis. Uh, don't forget to subscribe so you won't miss out any future content. And I can't wait to see you all in our next financial expedition. Happy investing, everyone!